open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is part three of our summer series called Church in the Wild. We're looking at the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read, actually, the entire chapter. It's 18 verses this morning, and so if you have not been on a regular schedule of reading your Bible, today you're going to read at least a chapter of the Bible, and so it's a good good place to start. Chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse number 1, says, Paul's writing, and he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what was or what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this all comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So by way of reminder, Paul's writing to believers at the city of Corinth. Corinth is a very cosmopolitan, large, influential city in the Greco-Roman world. It's situated in the area of what we would commonly refer to as Greece. It was a city with rich heritage, and it's populated, at least at this time, it's populated by citizens, Roman citizens, who have primarily come from provincial areas. It's not Italians. It's not even really Greeks, although that there's Greeks living there. It's people who have been given status. In many cases, what history tells us is that many of the people in the city of Corinth are people that came from Egypt. They were Egyptians who earned their status as Roman citizens. And many of the citizens of Corinth are people that were at one time slaves or indentured servants, but who were able to purchase their freedom and actually purchase their citizenship as Romans. And many of them were Greeks by reputation or by lineage, and and many were Jews. There was a large Jewish community in the city of Corinth, and many of them have now come to faith in Jesus. And out of all of those people, Paul comes in to the city of Corinth. He stays there for an extended period of time. He preaches the gospel, and he plants this church. He starts this church, and then he leaves, and in his absence, other people have come in as teachers. Many claim to be apostles. Many claim to be prophets and teachers. Many of them are coming from Jerusalem and Judea, and they are coming there, and they are contradicting 
Paul's gospel. Remember in Galatians 1, Paul says this, the gospel that I preach to you is not man's gospel, nor did I receive it from any man, but I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gospel, what was the distinction of Paul's gospel that was so controversial? The aspect of Paul's gospel that he preached that was so controversial was the gospel of grace. It was distinguished from what a lot of what Paul refers to as Judaizers were trying to preach, which was that the gospel or how a person is saved or made right with God is you keep the law plus you believe in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. It's the law plus. And Paul said, no, it's only the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Everything in the law was pointing towards the cross as a guardian or a, a tutor to get us to the point where we know that we had to be saved. But in Paul's absence, these teachers were coming and they were telling the, the Corinthians, and remember, many of the Corinthians came out of the synagogue, so they know the law. And they're just like, well, um, do we have to keep the law? And for a lot of them, they wanted, to, they wanted to kind of keep their foot in Judaism because remember, there's persecution taking place in the Roman, the Roman Empire for Christians. The one group of people in the Roman Empire that were allowed to practice their faith without persecution were the Jews. Jewish. So if you could keep your foot in Judaism and say, I believe in Jesus, but I still keep the law, then you could be considered a part of Judaism and you wouldn't experience persecution. But by coming out of that and saying, no, my hope is in Christ, and the synagogues and the leaders of the synagogues would push you out and say, you're no longer a Jew. Now you're susceptible to persecution. So these teachers who are coming in are questioning Paul's credentials as an apostle and a teacher, and they're also challenging the gospel that he preached. And it's been several years. It's been, a, it's been like three, four years since Paul's been there. He's written them a few letters, but now as we see in verse number one and two of chapter three, he's saying, what, what do you mean? Do I have to come and bring letters of recommendation or letters of reference so that you'll listen to what I have to say? Basically, what they were asking Paul is they're like, who vouches for you? Paul, I know what you're saying, but who vouches for you? How do we know that we should listen to you? In contrast to these other teachers who have come in and they've got letters of recommendation from Paul or from Peter in Jerusalem, from James and from other Jewish leaders who validate them and they're coming in and they go all the way back to Jesus. But what about you, Paul? Paul, you seem to be the odd man out. You're preaching something that they're not preaching. And Paul's response to them is, you want a letter of recommendation? You want a letter of reference? You're my letter of of recommendation. You want to know what validates me is you. I mean, imagine for a second, put it in this context. Imagine you raise kids, parents, you raise your kids and you buy them, you know, all their shoes, all their clothes. You pay for their education. You feed them, you house them. They grow up 18, 19, 20 years old. They leave the house. They move to New York City. You don't really have much contact with them, but then you begin to notice they're on 28, 29 years old. You begin to notice on social media, they're making some decisions. They're, they're making some investments. Their life is taking a turn. And so you reach out to them and you say, hey, I'm really concerned about you. And your kid's response back to you is, excuse me, do you have some letters of reference that you would like to give to me so that I should consider your advice? Can you imagine your kids like uh, provide references? This is when you wanna say, I'll tell you my reference. <laughs> You're my reference. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. I'm still dad. I'm still dad. That's what Paul is saying to them. He's like, I'm still dad. And the reason why this was becoming a controversy, this whole chapter, deals with one issue and one issue only. In fact, it's one word, it's status, status. Let me give you a definition of status just so we're on the same page here. Dictionary definition says status is position or rank in relationship to others. It's relative rank in a hierarchy of prestige, especially high prestige. It's the condition of a person or thing 
Even in the eyes of the law, it's the state or condition with respect to circumstances. So it's, it's all about status. They're asking Paul, hey, what's your status? Where do you rank in the food chain here? Why should we listen to you and not listen to other people? And the reason why this is really important for us to understand is Corinth, like much of the Roman world at that time in the first century, was obsessed with status. Everything operated according to status. Your status in society determined almost everything else about your life, and not only for you, but also for your children. And so people lived their lives trying to move up in position and status in society. If you were slave, you were trying to become free. Many of the people living in Corinth had experienced that. They had once been slaves, but in the Roman system, you could buy yourself out of slavery. And so many of them had bought themselves out and are now classified as, quote, freedmen and actual citizens of Rome with rights. Prior to that, you didn't have any rights. Many of them were Jewish, and so they were concerned about their status, that if they lost their status as Jewish, they could now be subject to persecution. They could lose their jobs. They could lose their home, confiscate their property. They could even potentially be killed because now they've stepped outside of the status of Judaism. If you were, uh, if you were a Roman, you had high status. And then even within you know, their own city, there were those who were wealthy and those who were poor. There were men and there were women. Those were two different statuses. A woman in a Roman society had very little rights. She, had, she couldn't own property. Uh, she, didn't, she didn't have rights in and of herself. When she married a man, the man gained all of her wealth, and the only rights she had was coming under the authority of her husband. A, but, but it's an issue of status. This was, they were consumed with status. And lest we judge them, we have to realize that that's nothing new. We're, we're obsessed with status even in our own day. We might call it image. It's a little bit different in our, in our culture, but we have classes of people. We have the wealthy and poor. We have high, upper class, middle class, lower class. We have uh, a lot of the same issues. We have status that's oftentimes based on political parties or socioeconomic statuses, wealthy and poor. We have black and white and brown. We have citizens and non-citizens. We've got all kinds of statuses. And without even thinking about it, it's kind of hardwired into us that we evaluate one another or we try to evaluate one another based on our statuses. And we're all trying to work to increase our status. So you want to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you want to come out of you know, rags into riches? What are you trying to do? Change your status. Think about the questions that we use in our society or the questions that we think about daily without really even using the word status, but these are things that we think about. So um, think about things like on social media. It's like, how many followers do you have? How many blue checks do you have? Do you have a blue check? Some of you are like, what's a blue check? Status. <laughs> Who did you vote for? Because who you voted for may determine on whether you're canceled. People try and pigeonhole you. Oh, you're a right-wing extremist. Oh, you're a Christian nationalist. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a secular globalist. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, Oh, you're a progressive leftist. Uh, or you must, you know, you're a Nazi or you're a communist. It's like, think about the, the crossfire that happens all the time on these issues. Or think about this. Um, what school did you go to? Jane went to Grand Rapids Christian High School. I remember when I was growing up, if you, that was the good Christian girls. There were two schools that all the preppies went to, Grand Rapids Catholic Central and Grand Rapids Christian. And so we used to look at them and go, oh, those are the good reformed, pretty little blonde Dutch girls. And uh, I went to Wyoming Rogers, which was like mullets, Metallica, and muscle cars. 
G, if you had a GED, it was like a PhD. That's the high school I went to. When I married Jane, my status went up. I married in a pretty little blonde girl. And I corrupted her by making her a charismatic pastor's wife. And so, but think about it even in terms of like degrees, like, well, uh, where did you go to college? You know, or did you go to college? Do you get a, a trade degree? Did you graduate high school? Do you have a GHD? Do you have a do you have an undergrad? Do you have a master's? Do you have a PhD? And then even even if you think, oh, I I went I got a bachelor's degree, then it's like, well, what school did you get it from? <laughs> well, I got it from Michigan. Well, I'm sorry, you know, terrible. What a terrible school. <laughs> I'm a Spartan. I went to Michigan State. Or, you know, I'm a Grand Valley State Laker. Or I went to an SEC school like Florida and Gainesville. It's like Tim Picking needs Jesus really bad. And, and we, oh, was it an Ivy League school? And then if you've got a master's degree. And can I just tell you something? Pastors do this. You don't know this because you're not in the pastoral world. But it's like, oh, you have a, a master's in theology? Where did you go to school? And then they evaluate based on the school. What are we trying to figure out? Status. We're trying to figure out, okay, where do I fit in the pecking order? How about this one? What neighborhood do you live in? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Oh you, li- oh, you live there? Oh. What kind of car do you drive? Car tells a lot about you. When I met Jane, uh, I was a poor kid in college. Or actually, I had been kicked out of college status. Um, <clears throat> but my dad had gotten in an accident, and his car was technically totaled, even though it still drove. It was a white Isuzu Impulse, 1987 white Isuzu Impulse. If you don't know what that is, it's right. And <laughs> Isuzu was like, I don't know, a cheap person's Honda. And, uh, but it was a cool looking car. He had gotten rear-ended into the car, so they just totaled it out. When they rear-ended him, the driver's seat torqued. So they totaled it out, but it still drove. My dad gave it to me. And so I took the back end that had been smashed in, and I like bungee cord, and I, I took plexiglass, and I put red tape on it, so I had tail lights and bungee cords and then duct tape to make sure that it was waterproof. It looked terrible from behind. On the front, if you were looking at it from the front, it looked like a cool car. But from the back, it was terrible. So when I'm trying to woo Jane to like me, I knew that she was a preppy girl, and so I backed in everywhere that we went so she would never see the backside of the car. (laughs) Status. Because the car tells you a lot about yourself. Or how about this? What brand of clothes do you wear? Why do we care about that stuff? Status. Status. I travel a fair bit. I'm in airports a lot. And one of the crazy, one of of my favorite things to do is people watch. Anybody else like people watching? It's so interesting. Airports are the best. Now here's my experience. My experience, I like to travel with a carry-on bag. Carry-on bag, because if you check in a bag, it's, you have to wait around, so I like put everything in a carry-on. And in a carry-on, I, I get a hard case. Here, You don't want to spend a lot of money on a carry-on case, because they get beat just to a pulp. They just toss them on everything, and you stick them in the overhead bin, and they rattle around, they get scraped up. So it's funny to sit there and watch people dragging along a Louis Vuitton carry-on. It's like a $5,000 carry-on bag. I'm like, why in the world would you do? I understand a carry-on like purse, handbag, tote, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, but a carry-on, that thing's going to get beat. What are, why does it matter if it's a Louis Vuitton or a, you know, Samsonite? Why does it matter? I want everybody to know who I am. It's got that little Louis Vuitton little signal on the brown and the black leather on there. Yeah, I'm letting everybody know. What am I letting them know? Status. When you were, if you grew up in the 70s, it was bell bottoms. If you grew up in the 80s, it was pop your collar, wear your Ralph Lauren polo, rugby shirts, and your, you know, your bugle boy jeans, and, and your 
you know, you had an Izod shirt underneath your thing with the collar popped and then an Oxford over the top of it. You had your mullet, business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> Ladies, you had helmet hair, you had the big old bangs. Most of the climate change that took place, the hole in the ozone, came from the Aquanet that was used by the girls in the 80s. It's true. You all know it. Girl, I mean, go look at a yearbook. It was like bangs are like this, like helmet hair. All the, and the bigger your hair was, the higher your status. It was all like shh. Girls used to like hold on to the rabbit ears of our TV and we could pick up stations in China because their bangs are like satellite dishes. Guys are walking around with, remember the green bottle polo? Or Dracar Noir, the black, the black bottle. I don't know when that went out of style. I stopped wearing it two months ago, but <laughs> all that stuff is status. We want people to see us as significant and important. But here's what's very important in what Paul's getting to. By the way, the very, the very same people at Corinth that he's writing to now having to defend his apostleship, he says, of course I'm your apostle. Of course you know me. You wouldn't exist without me. There might be flashy teachers who come in giving you a message and a gospel that seems easier, that doesn't cost you as much, that feels better because you're doing something with the strength of your own hand and achieving, and you feel like it's upward mobility in the kingdom of God. But, but listen, you know who I am. I am your apostle. You know that I love you and that, I, that I, I am pivotal in your very existence. You guys are hung up on all the wrong things. Earlier, in an earlier letter in 1 Corinthians, here's what he told them. This is shortly after the church begins. He says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, consider your calling brothers, that not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many of you were powerful, not many of you were of noble birth. What's this about status? But God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. You know what that tells me? It's the fact that I have status before God, status in the church, status in the kingdom of God, which is righteousness. I'm, I'm holy, I'm a saint, I'm a child of God, it has nothing to do with the fact that Wow, God couldn't live without me. Wow. I mean, of course, of course. Of course God would want me. No. Actually, it's the opposite. God loves to take things that have no status. He loves to take people, actually, that have a stigma, that have been rejected, that have been overlooked, that the rest of the world looks like and goes, that kid's gonna be a mess. Or that guy, are you kidding me? Whether it's Matthew the tax collector or whether it's Simon the zealot or whether it's a kid in Pontiac on Sarasota Street whose name is Lee who grows up in a single mom home, God loves to take the people without the world's status and say, let me show the world my wisdom, my glory, and my power. Let me, let me astound the strong. Let me turn over the status hierarchies of the world and of society and the things that men and women put their trust in. And the logos and the brands and the image and the wealth and the power and the influence and who you know and how you can leverage and who you can network with. Let me just take somebody out of nowhere and let me just put my glory on them and let me transform their lives so radically that there is no other explanation for their life other than a supernatural touch of God. This is what God does. And Paul's telling them, don't forget this. 
Don't get sucked into the vortex of trying to seek out status through the world's means that you miss out on the grace of God, that you miss out on the touch of God. Let me tell you one quick story about somebody that's in your Bible that you probably never thought much about, that history actually gives us insight into from the city of Corinth. He's a man named Erastus. Three verses Paul makes reference to him in the New Testament. Romans chapter 13 in his salutation, he says this in verse 23. And also Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus greet you. Then in Acts 19, it says, and having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers. That word there, helpers, literally means servants. So Paul sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus. And he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And then the last time that he's mentioned is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. It says, and Paul writes, Erastus remained at Corinth. Why did he remain at Corinth? Because this is his hometown. What does the Bible tell us about Erastus? Number one, it tells us that he was a city treasurer or a public servant. It tells us that he was also a servant and a helper. This is not something that somebody of high status would ever describe themselves as. And then the third thing is we know that he was part of Paul's travel ministry for a period of time, went on several trips, but ultimately came back to Corinth. That's basically what we know about him. But let me tell you what history tells us. Look at the screen here. This is an engraved stone that was excavated on the ruins of the city of Corinth. This is from around the year 50 AD, about the same time that Paul brings the gospel to Corinth. After they've excavated this whole city, they found this. And what it says is Erastus, it's his name. It identifies him as the city treasurer. and actually says Erastus, in return for his servantship, laid the pavement for this road at his own expense. So here's what scholars believe happened. Paul comes into Corinth. He begins to preach the gospel to anybody he meets. And he meets a man who is of high status, who's a government official working in the Roman government, provincial over Corinth, He's a city treasurer. He's in charge of the money. He's wealthy. He's of high status. He's worked his way up into this position. You don't become a city official in the Roman world unless you have gone through a long duration of faithfulness. You've worked your way up in status. And now he paves the road, one of the central roads in the city of Corinth, at his own expense. How many wish in Kalamazoo we had an Erastus to just go ahead and get these roads done? I'm sick of orange cones. It's like a maze, a labyrinth, even trying to get home anymore. It's like, okay, but Erastus pays for it himself. Now, typically, when somebody in the ancient culture, in Greco-Roman culture, did something philanthropic like this, what they would do was they would put their name on it, but then they would also say dedicated to, and then this deity, whether it was Zeus or whether it was Epaphrodite or whatever it was, whatever their patron God was, because they believed that by doing this, they were garnering spiritual favor from that God who would work on their behalf. But what we notice about this and what archaeologists notice about this is this man he doesn't list any other deity. It just says that he did it out of his own funds as a gift to the people of Corinth. Here's what most scholars deduce from this. Paul comes into Corinth, finds this man of high status, finds this man who has worked his way up to the very top, leads him to the Lord, and eventually this man steps out of his high status. He gives up his status so that he can travel with Paul and bring the gospel. And the last thing that he does in his stewardship is he takes a lot of his wealth and he pays for a road to be done, the very road that he leaves his office, leaves the city and travels with Paul to bring the gospel to other cities. This man does what is unthinkable 
in the Roman world. He exchanges his status, high status, in the city where everybody knows him, that he's worked for, that he's climbed the corporate ladder. He trades all of it so that he can now be called a servant and a helper to this radical Jew who is traveling from city to city talking about a resurrected Messiah. It's an example of what happens in the kingdom of God. Even a person of high status like Erastus is willing to give it all up so that he can gain a status before God that no man could ever give him. So how do we gain status spiritually? How do we gain spiritual status? Because when, we, when we're talking about what Paul's writing here, talking about two covenants, he's, in chapter three, he's talking about the, the ministry of condemnation, that's talking about the law of Moses, versus the ministry of, of life or the ministry, the administration or the the grace of God, the new covenant, that's what Jesus purchased for us on the cross. These are two different ways that even to this day, most people are trying to gain spiritual status with God. There's really one of two approaches. And for many of these people who have a Jewish background, they're familiar with the law of Moses and have spent their whole lives trying to gain right status before God, i.e. salvation, by keeping the law perfectly. And Paul takes time here and he begins to unpack the differences between the old covenant and what he's preaching is the new covenant. Why is this important? Because all those people who are challenging his authority to this church are coming in and trying to put them under the old law. They're trying to say, no, it's the law plus Jesus. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. If you do that, you're, you're acting as if somehow you can, just like you buy status in the world, you think you can buy status with God. It doesn't work. And he compares the two, law and grace. And if anybody knows anything about the law, it's Paul. And if anybody knows what it's like to have status because of the law, it's Paul. Paul. Think of his very words that he says in Philippians chapter three. In Philippians chapter three, Paul says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also if anyone else thinks he has reason or confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, status, He says, I was blameless. Paul literally is saying that I lived as a law-keeping Jew my entire life. Paul, as a teacher of the law, would have memorized the whole, basically the first five books of the Old Testament in three languages, word for word. And he says, you want to know how accurate I was in it? I never violated it one time. Blameless. 613 laws. He had status. But verse seven, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I've counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. Woo! in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from keeping the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see, there's two ways that most people try to gain status with God. One is the law. Now, whether you're like literally the Old Testament law or if it's just religious observation. That's one of the ways that so many people try and keep the law. They try and gain right standing before God. You ask them, are you a Christian? It's like, well, I believe in God. You ask them, why do you think you should go to heaven? Well, I've done a lot, a lot more good than I've done bad. Or I try and keep the commandments. You know what that is? That is the old covenant. We're trying to gain righteous status before God by the things that we do. And you know what that produces? It produces spiritual death, It's empowered by our flesh, and it's based on 
our good works and our perfection. The Bible actually says, the Old Testament says, if you violate the law one time, you're guilty of it all. Imagine living your whole life. You've never broken the law. 613 commandments. By the way, how many believe in the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. It's in your Bible. Do you believe it? It's not a trick question. I believe in the Ten Commandments. Do you believe in them? Raise your hand if you believe in the Ten Commandments. Put your hand down. How many can tell me what the Ten Commandments are? Raise your hand. How can you believe in something you don't know? <laughs> Have no other God besides me. Don't take the name of the Lord, your name in vain. Don't create any carved images or idols. Honor the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. The Ten Commandments are just like the summation of 613 laws. They have a curse attached to them. And it was never, listen, it was never God's intention that you and I would somehow try to have a righteous status before him where he goes and goes, okay, yes, you're saved. You've earned it. You've paid the price. You've done a lot of good. You've done more good than bad. You're not as bad as some. Okay, you're saved. It was never God's intention that we would have right standing with him by works of the law. Then you might ask, well, why'd give the, why, why did God give us the law? Well, let me show you something. Turn in your Bibles over to um, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This is maybe something you've never seen before. But it's when God gives the Ten Commandments or he gives the law. Exodus 20, verse 18 says this. Now when all the people, this is all the children of Israel brought out of Egypt. When all the people saw the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and they stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But don't let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to all the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of the Lord may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood afar off, but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So here's what, you know, we've all seen pictures of Moses with the tablets of the Ten Commandments, holding those stone tablets. Paul makes reference to them. He says, listen, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the commandments that are written on tablets of stone. I'm talking about the commandments of God that are written on human hearts. That's the new covenant. It's written on our hearts, not written on tablets of stone. Do you know that originally, though, before God gave Moses stones with the Ten Commandments listed on them, when God first drew near to them, after he had brought them out of Egypt, and he told Moses, tell the people, I'm coming don't touch the mountain, but wait for me, I'm coming. When God drew near to them in this glorious manifestation of his presence, I think of a supernatural thunderstorm filled with thunder and lightning and the voices of angels and the sounds of trumpets. God clothed himself in this thunderstorm and he came and he hovered over the top of Mount Sinai, which even to this day is scorched black from the fire. And God spoke his commandments over them and to them with his own voice. Rabbis say that this was a wedding ceremony where Yahweh was marrying himself to the bride called Israel that he had won for himself out of Egypt and this mountain was the ceremonial altar in which he was making his vows as he spoke the commandments to them. And their response should have been, yes, Lord. They should have gone into this Sinai covenant, this marriage covenant with them. But as God was speaking, actually rabbis, this is interesting, they say that when God spoke the law the first time, he spoke it in 70 different languages because they believed that there were 70 different people groups or nations on the earth. He spoke it simultaneously in the language of every people group on the earth. He spoke it over them. But what was their response? Their response was, Stop. Moses, tell God to stop speaking. Because the voice of God 
always, whenever God speaks to us, it always awakens within us a knowledge of our sinfulness and God's holiness. And the voice of God speaking was bringing conviction to them, which should have pushed them towards repentance. But instead they said, God, stop. Moses, tell God not to speak to us anymore. Moses, you go talk to God for us. And tell God to write down what he wants us to do, and we'll do it. Outward religious observance. Tell God, write it down, and we'll do it, but don't let him speak to us anymore. Think about that in comparison with what Jesus said in Matthew when he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How does man live? By the preceding word of God. If we live by the word of God, how do we die? We die by the absence of the word of God. But they thought, hey, God, you're making us uncomfortable with your voice and your presence. We don't like being uncomfortable. So what we would rather have you do is give us a checklist of things you want us to do. We'll do them and then be on with our lives and you can just give a status called righteous. And God says, oh, you think you can do this on your own? You, you, you think without me? You think without my spirit? You think without me giving you grace that you can work your way to be right with me? Okay. Here's a couple checklists for you. Have at it. And the Old Testament is nothing but the story of man's failure where man was satisfied with keeping God at an arm's length distance so that we could prove our own status and our own ability. And we fail every single time. But that's where grace came in. Because Galatians says that God gave the law to us, not as a means, not as a roadmap to righteousness, but as a way of showing us how broken and helpless our status really is. You know what our status is without Jesus? Dead. You know what our status is without the cross? Doomed. The best of us on our best day fail. But God didn't leave us there. That glory was fading away God sent his son and he offered through the blood of Jesus, the cross of Christ, a new covenant. And this is what Paul says he's come to preach. Guys, I didn't come to preach a new version of the law. I came to set you free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He's saying to them, many of you have lived your whole lives to purchase your freedom, but you don't realize you're still a slave. But if you will let go of the status of religious observation, trying to keep the law, then you can actually Discover the gospel of grace, that it's God writing his law on your hearts, the tablet of flesh, and giving you the ability to walk before him in relationship before him, that that's where true freedom is. Look at verse 16, he says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. You see, we all, I, I think the Corinthians, even to this day, many people ask, well, even in Israel, the Jewish people, why don't they believe in Jesus as the Messiah? Well, the Bible says that there's coming a day when they will. But right now, it says a partial hardening has happened. And even now, when the Bible is read, the Old Testament, the law is read, the Bible says that there's a veil over their eyes. Why? It's because their whole lives they've been taught that the way you are right before God is in keeping the law. They can't see beyond that veil. But they're not the only ones with the veil. In American culture today, how many people, when you ask them what they believe, they'll say, well, I'm spiritual. And what we're really saying is, I have a DIY relationship with God. I do it myself. I watch some inspirational motivation. I meditate. I try and do good deeds. What's that? Religious observation. Guess what that status gets you? Nothing. Gets you death. But in the church even, we get wrapped up in spiritual status. 
But it's all, what we need to come back to is what Paul's saying is it's all based on grace because the new covenant is not about outward observation. It's about inward transformation of the heart by the spirit of God. That's what happens when our eyes opened up. When one turns to the Lord, it says our veil is removed. Paul knows this because Paul turned to the Lord. You and I know this because many of us in this room have turned to the Lord. Why do we turn to the Lord? Because we've been staring at the wrong thing for too long but maybe long enough to realize status in the world, my own ability and my, my failures are never gonna save me. It's time for me to turn towards something else. And when we turn to the Lord and we look at the cross and we see the price that he paid, that it's not about my work and my perfection, it's about Jesus's finished work and his perfection that died on the cross, became a curse for us so that we can be blessed, that my heart gets open and my life gets changed. Then his spirit comes to live on the inside of us and he writes his law on our hearts and we realize the only status that I really need is the status of God looking at me through the blood of Jesus and saying, righteous, righteous. I don't see your sin anymore. I don't see your failure anymore. I don't love you because you're rich. I don't love you because you're black. I don't love you because you're a Republican. I don't love you because you're an American. I don't love you because you've read your Bible all five days this week before you came to church on Sunday. I don't love you because you tithe. I don't love you because you serve. I don't love you because you didn't cut somebody off on the highway. I don't love you because you don't lie, cheat, and steal. I love you because I've adopted you as my child and I've given you a status called son and daughter of God that will never be taken away. It'll never be taken away. It's called imputed. It's a theological term, but it basically is like, it's a rich person who takes a poor person and says, from this day forward, everything that I have belongs to you. And it's a legal it's a legal decision that once it is made can never be undone. And you say, who's dumb enough to do that? Depends on if you're the rich person or you're the poor person. Who takes a street orphan homeless enemy and adopts them and signs their name on the deed of everything that they has and says, this belongs to you. It's a, anything that you say, anything that you do, it's as if I'm doing it. You know who does that? God. That's scandalous. This is what leads Paul to say this. Galatians 6, verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world. Do you know what Paul's saying? All my status symbols, all my high position, all of my privileges, what other people thought of me, all that I worked for, all that I looked at as this is getting me somewhere, I count it as rubbish. And I'm not gonna boast in anything that I've done. The only thing I'm gonna live my life to boast in is the cross. Well, look at what you've done, Paul. You wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and Paul says, the cross. Paul, you planted a whole bunch of churches. Woo! The cross. Paul, you've been through some hard times. It's, you've suffered a lot. You've suffered a lot for Jesus. He's like, I haven't suffered anything compared to what he suffered for me. I'm crucified to the world. In other words, the world's system, the world's values, the world's structure, the world's opinions. You can't cancel somebody who's dead. And you can't cancel an apostle who has crucified his self and his life and the world to himself and doesn't find any validation or any validation or affirmation or status through anything other than what Jesus says that can never be revoked. That's a dangerous life. And that's the life that Jesus is calling all of us to find. Life in him. I want you to stand with me this morning. In Christ alone will I glory. I 
I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Galatians 2.20. That's a radically different way of living than just, oh, I go to church, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, I try to read my Bible, try to do good things, I'm spiritual. It's radically different. It's a radically different status. You know, the world tries to shape all kinds of statuses, rich, poor, black, white, conservative, liberal, educated, uneducated. There's really only two statuses in the whole universe, though. Two. The first status is lost, dead in your sins, unable to make yourself right before God, deserving of judgment and hell, it's called a sinner. All of us are born that way. And the other status is saint. Saved, not by your good works, but by what Jesus did on the cross. By faith, you've chosen to believe that that's more important than anything else. And the ramifications of that belief have changed your life. And you're being changed from glory to glory by his spirit at work in your life. Heaven is your home. Nothing can change that. And it's not dependent on your perfection. That's a status that you're not born with, but you're born again into. That's the only two statuses in the universe. And all of us in this room fit into one of those two statuses. This morning, I pray that you would ask yourself, what is status to me and what is my status before God? And the good news is if today as you examine your heart, you say, I've been trusting in the law, I've been trusting in performance and even religious observation, but I know that that's done to be left behind today. I need, I need the status that only Jesus can give me. That can only be imputed to me. Here's the good news. He gives it to whoever asks. You just have to exchange every other status for that one. It lasts forever. Would you bow your heads with me this morning all across this room? If today you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Lord of your life, you're born again, saved, not because you've earned it, but because by faith you've asked Jesus into your heart and into your life. I want you to just raise your hand in confidence and say, yes, Jesus is Lord of my life. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Today, if you could not raise your hand to that because you're unsure, you say, well, I'm not sure if that's true of me. Or because maybe you just know, I'm not, I am not right with God. I have, I, I'm aware of the fact that I have been trusting in myself, my strength, my ability, even religious observation, but today, I'm fully aware of that, but today I want to change status. Today, for those of you who could not raise your hand and say, yes, I know I'm right with God, I know I'm saved because of Jesus, but today I wanna to receive the gift of eternal life. I want to become a child of God. How do I do that? Today, I'm gonna to lead you in a prayer that will activate the life of God in your heart, and today you can become a child of God, a saint. You say, how do I do that? You have to believe in your heart that Jesus died for you, that he rose again. And then number two, you have to confess him as Lord. Repent, say, God, I'm not gonna live for myself any longer today. I'm asking you to save me. And he will do it every single time. But today, as an act of your faith, if you're here and you either don't know if you're right with God or today you're saying, I wanna get right with God, pray for me all across this room. If you wanna be included in this prayer today, your step of faith right now is just raise your hand. Say, include me in that prayer today. I wanna get right with God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else today? God's, he's willing to save you and forgive you and give you a new heart and a new status. If you've not raised your hand, raise it right now and say, include me. I wanna get right with God. Pray for me. Thank you, thank you. 
You can put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. The Bible says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. I'm just going to lead all of us in, in this prayer. And when we say amen, those of you who believe in Jesus for the first time, you're going to have a change of status. Here we go. Everyone say this prayer out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name and I confess I am a sinner far from God and I deserve judgment. But today I repent and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he died for me on the cross and that he rose again to give me eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. I make you Lord of all. Forgive me of my sin and write your law on my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Make me a child of God. Thank you for loving me, pursuing me, and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, if you just prayed that prayer, you are right now a child of God. Your status has changed forever. A million years from now, you will look back on this day, and it will be the day when everything changed because Jesus Christ is Lord of all.